I'm going to show you something that most people don't know about the enemy's defeat. Let's go to Colossians 2, 14. Here Paul takes us to the cross, which is the moment of the devil's defeat. Paul says he canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. That describes the moment that you were forgiven of past, present, and future sins. That's another reason why, as I said in the last point, that the devil can't change God's mind about you because you are forgiven. But let's continue on to verse 15. In this way, Jesus disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. The meaning of that verse has gotten a bit lost in translation. What the original readers would have understood, what that verse describes, is that the cross was an event called a triumphal procession. You say, what is that, Kyle? Some Bible versions call it a parade. I think the message version illustrates it the best. It says, he stripped all the spiritual tyrants in the universe of their sham authority and marched them naked through the streets. You see, that's what a triumphal procession was. It was an event that happened after a victorious army came back from a war. During the war, they captured the leader of the enemy army and sometimes they cut off his fingers and toes. Definitely they took his weapons. And to prove to their people that the enemy truly was defeated and no longer a threat, you know, because they didn't have broadcast news like we did. So they actually had to prove to people, display that this enemy was defeated. And they did it through this parade, whereby they'd march the enemy leader naked through the streets. Now, he was still alive. He was still present. Maybe, I don't know, maybe he could even shout things as he passed by the people, kind of as the last desperate attempt of a madman. But he really was powerless to do anything to the people anymore. So there was no reason for the people to be afraid of him anymore. That is what this verse is showing us. Yes, at one point, there was a tug of war for your soul that the enemy had waged. There was a power that he held against you. But because of Jesus and your faith in what he did, the war for your soul is over. The cross dethroned him. The Bible says that the blood of Jesus speaks against him. And Paul wrote this verse to show we believers that though the devil may still be alive, He's only alive to kick and scream, but he's been stripped of his power. He can't really do anything to defeat you anymore because even if his kicking and screaming makes your surroundings uncomfortable or gives you a headache, the victory is, as my friend Ann Voskamp says so well, the victory is that your way home is secure. Somebody's got to get this. Though you may really be struggling, your struggles are only the last desperate attempts of a madman who is defeated. But your way home is secure. He can't take that away. If you have placed your faith in the fact that Jesus did the work for the forgiveness of your sins, that you don't have to work them off yourself, then the Bible says that the power of sin is dead in your life. It doesn't mean you don't sin. Nobody's saying that. It just means it can't do anything to you. Sure, the enemy can use it to accuse you, and it can have natural consequences, of course. But the enemy can't use it to define you nor separate you from God anymore. He's lost his power. 
But if you believe that the devil is more powerful than he really is, then first you might actually believe what he's shouting at you. And that's harmful for all kinds of reasons. If for nothing else, then you only rise to the level of who you believe you are. But secondly, it's going to cause you to waste your time on a whole lot of fruitless efforts. And take it from someone who's been there. Starting at 16 years old, I went head first into the faith. I mean, I went to a Christian undergrad school. I worked for one of the 15 largest churches in the country. For a time, I was in church every day of the week. Monday was advanced Bible study. Tuesday was spiritual growth seminar. Wednesday, I was a youth leader. Thursday was small group. Friday was intercessory prayer. Then there was Saturday night service followed by Sunday morning service. I eventually then became second in charge of another ministry. I went to seminary and got my master's in biblical studies. I did all the eight steps to this and seven ways to pray for that. And 10 years into all that, I said to God, why am I still feeling so defeated? What more do I have to do? And God said, there's nothing more you have to do. In fact, he said, my doing was the problem. He said, I needed to stop fighting and trying to produce victory and start standing in the victory I already had because of Jesus. This brings me to the fifth lie that people believe about the devil. And that's that you have to fight the devil. Now, I can hear some of you thinking, but, 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 Kyle, what about James 4, 7? Where he says, so humble yourselves before God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Well, I am glad you asked because this actually proves my point. Again, some of this has gotten lost in translation a little bit. Two words are important for understanding this verse. First, as I teach so much, I feel like a broken record with this lately, but we got to understand this. The word devil is not just a name, it's a job description. Devil in Greek is diabolos, which means slanderer. And as I said, about all he can do is shout. Look what you've done. Look what you do. Look what you face. Look what you feel. God can't love you. God can't use you. You're not even a Christian. Well, you don't take boxing gloves to slander. You take truth to it. That word resist there is on to me, which is the same word Peter uses in 1 Peter 5, 9 when he says stand firm against the devil. Resist is the same as the word stand. So you can read James 4, 7 to say stand against the slanderer and he will flee from you. And you do that simply by renewing your mind and being so convinced of God's truths about you, that he loves you, that you're good with him, of who you are and what you have in him, that even though you might hear the enemy's accusations. You might hear his shouts. You might hear his roars. They won't sink in. They don't sink in. Not when you are standing on truth. Not when you are so convinced with your ultimate reality, which is the truth of God's word. Listen. The devil is real, but he isn't God's fault. He's mad at God for banishing him out of heaven. And he's mad at you because as one made in God's image, you remind him of who he can never be. But since he can't do anything to God, nor change God's mind, he prowls the earth, lying and accusing, to try to change your mind. But that's all he can do. Because the reality is, he's defeated. The cross dethroned him, and the blood of Jesus speaks against him. So don't waste your energy trying to fight a devil who is defeated, but simply stand in the victory 
of the one who defeated him. Hey, there's a secret strategy against your mind, and it's what's behind your battles with fear, insecurity, guilt, shame, even depression. After more than a decade in ministry and plenty of personal experience, I discovered that the devil deceptively uses truth to get you to swallow lies that are at the heart of your most toxic emotions and behaviors. He'll alert you to something that is true about you, maybe a weakness or something you fell to. Then he'll interpret what that means. Things like nobody will love you or even God is mad at you. Do you see it? By using something that really did happen, the devil then moves into the realm of hypothetical doom and gloom, often without you even realizing it. Cue the battles. That's why as I explore in my book, Shut Up Devil, the path to true freedom really is all in your mind. Seriously, as you get your beliefs aligned with God's truths, everything else starts to get in line. Get Shut Up Devil today at kylewinkler.org or wherever books are sold.